Amaru, the land of Amaru, or the Plum Serpent. You're in the land of the Plum Serpent. You understand? In the land of Quetzalcoatl. And who was Quetzalcoatl? We're gonna get. All right. So we're in this book. It's called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. Y'all, a lot of you probably familiar with this book. Have heard of it. Of course, I know a lot of you've heard of Manly P. Hall. You know who that is. Yeah, we're talking about you know high degree Freemasons here. Yeah, we know. But you know they be dropping jewels and they they teach themselves these things. You know they they keep the truth to themselves because you know knowledge is power, right? So they use this power against us, right? But then they add their hijack into it, right? So, but they know certain things, right? That we're learning today. They they've known these things, all right? So let me just show you one example. We, what we were just talking about, all right? So, and it says here. The red children of the sun, the red, all right, copper colored, <laughs> red, they call you the red man, right? Right, writes James Morgan Preecy, do not worship the one God. For them, that one God is absolutely impersonal, and all of the forces emanated from that one God are personal. This is the exact reverse of the popular Western conception of a personal God and personal work and forces in nature. Decide for yourself which of these beliefs is the more f philosophical. These children of the sun adore the plumbed serpent. Mm, they adore the plumbed serpent, really. Who is the messenger of the sun? The messenger of the sun? He was the god Quetzalcoatl. All right, so the plumbed serpent is Quetzalcoatl, right? We just got that before. All right, the Amaru is the plumbed serpent. So the plumbed serpent is Quetzalcoatl. So we're talking about the same thing. In Mexico, uh, Gukumats and Quiche, same person. And in Peru, he was called Amaru. He was called Amaru Quetzalcoatl. From the latter name comes our word America. From the latter, from this Amaru, Amara, remember? The land of Amaraca, Amaruca is literally translated land of the plumbed serpent. Amaruca is the land of the plumbed serpent. America is the land of Amaru, the land of Quetzalcoatl, the land of plumbed serpent the dragon, right? The priests of this god of peace from their chief center in the Cordilleras once ruled both Americas. The priests of this god of peace. Who are we talking about? We're talking about Prester John? We're talking about King David? We're talking about King David who once ruled both Americas, North and South? All right, Mexico and Peru, all the kingdoms, all the red men who have remained true to the ancient religion and all you still who are called red men, talking about the so-called Negro, right? Who have remained true to your ancient religion or your ancient law, your ancient, ancient connection with your creator, most high, are still under their sway. One of their strong centers was in Guatemala and of their order was the author of the book called Popol Vuh. In the Quiche tongue, Gugu Gukumat is the exact equivalent of Quetzalcoatl in the Nahuatl language, Quetzal, the bird of paradise, coat, serpent, the serpent built in plumes of the paradise bird. All right, this is deep right here. We're gonna get, get into this a little bit more. All right, all right, so let's learn a little bit about this character, Amaru, Amaru, aka Quetzalcoatl, Gugu Mutz. All right, Kukukan. All right, so we're in this book, Publications of the University of Pennsylvania. 
a series in philology literature and archaeology volume three so it's a primer of mayan hieroglyphics all right by daniel g brinton and a m m d l l d s c look at he got all the letters all right professor of american archaeology and linguistics in the university of pennsylvania president of the american association for the advancement of science etc etc now right, we're going to pick up here in page 39 right about here it says in the myth he is described as clothed in a long robe now they're talking about uh itzama who is uh they're relating to kumats and kukulkan and we know that it's the same as Kitsukot. we got that uh, as well uh from the last readings that amaru is also kukutsmats right Right, in Kishé. So it's, we're talking about the same people. So it says that this person, right, this this mythical person, is described as clothed in a long robe. All right, a long robe, long robe, and wearing sandals. Hmm, a long robe and wearing sandals. And what is noteworthy, having a beard. What is noteworthy? What is most noteworthy? All right, because he has a long robe, sandals, and a beard. Who does that describe, him, man? Who does that sound like? In the calendars of the centaurs, he was painted in the likeness of a man and a snake. And the masters explained this as the snake with feathers, which moves in the waters. That is, the heavenly waters, the cloud and the rains, for which recent Bishop Nunez de la Vega, to whom we owe this information, identified him with the Mexican mixed cult, the cloud serpent. Whereas Bishop Landa was in opinion that he was the Mexican Quetzalcoatl, all right, Amaru. All right, so we're talking about Quetzalcoatl. Remember why we got there, right? Because we were talking about the kings of Amaraca or Amaru, right? Amaraca, Amaru, right? On the Pacific coast had a road which followed the course of the Andes Mountains connecting their city with the capital of Kundin, Amaraca, right? Remember, this was in Bogota, which is modern-day Colombia today, Bogota, right? Bogota. And remember that it told us uh, down here that that they placed a cross right on the tomb, which was the American Peruvian sign for the word Amaru, a cross, Amaru, all right? And with the addition of the word Ka, or land, represents the sacred national name America. So remember, Amaru is Quetzalcoatl, all right? So we're, we're in this other book called Researches Concerning the Institutions and Monuments of the Ancient Inhabitants of America, I just read by Alexander the Humble. Again, this is another book by Alexander the Humble that we've read from it before. All right, we're going to go to page uh, 29. So we'll start out the page uh, at the bottom of page 28. It says, though no traditions point out any direct connection between the nations of North and South America, their history is not less fraught with an analogies in the political and religious revolutions from which states the civilization of the Aztecs, the Muiscas, and the Peruvians. All right, Muiscas, we've got that in the, the other book. Men with beards, again, men with beards, and with clearer complexions than the natives of Anahuac. Cundinamarca, look at that, Cundinamarca, Anamarca, there you go, Anamarca. That's in Bogota, right, with the kings of Amaraca were. All right, so these uh, people with beards with clearer complexions does not mean white, that doesn't mean white and the elevated plain of Cusco make their appearance without any indication of the place of their birth and bearing the title of high priest high priest of legislators all right lawgivers of the friends of peace and the arts which flourish under its auspices operated sudden change in the policy of the nations who hailed their arrival with veneration Quetzalcoatl, Boshika and Manco Capac are the sacred names of these mysterious beings all right so Quetzalcoatl who is Amaru remember Quetzalcoatl is Amaru it's also Boshika from the Bogot from the people in Colombia or Bogota region same place as where Kundin Aramarca is all right and Manco Capac is uh, an Amaru right and Inca one of the first all right it says Quetzalcoatl clothes in a black sacerdotal robe a black sacerdotal robe all right in a robe again comes from Panuco, from the shores of the Gulf of Mexico. Boshika, the Buddha of the Muishkas, the Buddha. Who's the real Buddha? We're talking about Quetzalcoatl, right? We're talking about that Buddha's first name is Guatama, right? Like Guatemala. Guatemala and his mom's name is Maya, right? Buddha's mom's name is Maya. We're talking about Quetzalcoatl, all right? Who is Boshika? Who is the Buddha of the Muishkas? Muishka, 
Meshach, Muishka, Moshko, Moshe. All right, now we're in this different book. All right, it's a little blurry, all right, but bear with me, you know. That's the way it's just, you know, it is. It was very pixelated. All right, but it's called The Myths of Mexico and Peru by Louis Spence. All right, got him from some of my Atlantis books. Very good author. Uh, quotes a lot of good sources. All right. And it says here, Quetzalcoatl is... Quetzalcoatl. It is highly probable that Quetzalcoatl was a deity of the pre Nahua people of Mexico. I pre meaning before the Nahua says he was regarded as the father of the Toltecs. And legend says that the seventh and youngest son of the Toltec Abraham, Ichtachimosh Kuhalt, hmm, Quetzalcoatl, whose name means feathered serpent or feathered staff, staff, the staff, became a relatively early period ruler of Tolan, and by his enlightened sway and his encouragement of the liberal arts did much to further the advancement of his people. Perhaps the most important of these is that which regards Quetzalcoatl as a god of the air. He is connected, say some, with the cardinal points and wears the insignia of the cross. He wears the insignia of the cross which symbolizes them. Again, we're in the book Discovery of the Origin of the Name of America, all right? We're still talking about the name of America, right? It says that they put the sign of the cross was placed on the tombs of people who got bit by snakes, which is the American Peruvian sign for the word Amaru. The cross is Amaru, is Quetzalcoatl, the cross, Amaru. And with the addition of the word Ka or land represents the sacred national name America, Amaru, Amaru, the cross, the cross. We're in the book Anacalypsis, an attempt to draw aside the veil of the static Isis or the inquiry into the origin of the languages, nations, and religions by the late Je Godfrey Higgins. All right, volume two, 1836. All right, and it says here, Quetzalcoatl or Cotle is represented in the paintings of the Codex Borgianus. All right, so he's represented in the Mexican Codex. Right, nailed to the cross, nailed to the cross. Some sometimes even to two thieves are the crucified with him. So it says sometimes even two thieves are crucified with him, just like the story of Jesus. Right, it's a coat. All right, in volume two, plate seventy-five, the God is crucified in the heavens in a circle of nineteen figures, the number of the Metonic cycle. A serpent is depriving him of the organs of generation. In the Codex Borgianus. The Mexican god is represented crucified and nailed to the cross, and in another place hanging to it, with a cross in his hands. And in one instance where the figure is not merely outlined, the cross is red. The clothes are colored, and the face and hands quite black. The face and hands quite black. If this was the Christianity of the German Nestorius, how came, how came he to teach that the crucified Savior was black? Oh, why didn't he teach that the Savior was black? so-called black or a negro right copper colored right why didn't they teach that you see what they're telling you and these codices in the uh, aztec and uh, these mexican codices right quetzalcoatl or the person being crucified their savior right who's being crucified is black or so-called black a negro person right the name of the god who was crucified was quetzalcoatl again quetzalcoatl all right, we're back in the book, Mythos of Mexico and Peru. And then, I mean, there's this image here. And they're talking about Quetzalcoatl, right? All right, and I uh, just want you to, let me just close in. I mean, let me just show you. This is another copy of the same book. Uh, you can see this image right here, which says, The age Quetzalcoatl leaves Mexico on a raft of serpents. On a raft of serpents, right? Is he flying on a dragon? What's, what's going on here? All right, so Quetzalcoatl, right? You can't see him, right? But on this version of it, which is blurry, if we zoom in, we can see him, right? Let's just zoom in to him real quick. All right, can y'all see this? Can y'all kind of make out? Look what they're showing you right here. This is Quetzalcoatl. Look at the clothing, the robe, look at the beard. You can almost see long hair. All right, this is the PDF I got of it. So you can see it better. Who is that? Is this the, the Grand Khan? Is this King David? Is this Prester John? Meshi Moses Kitsakol Jehoshua Jahawashi? What are we looking at right here? 
Amaru. It's a cult Amaru. So it's your Ancient America Foundation. All right, so it's Italy Chotlint, which is uh, an author uh, in those times, a Spaniard, um, maybe mixed with Indian. It's a cult in Jesus Christ. So it's here. All right. Says in Mexico's Great Central Mesa, where Itzli Xotlit lived, the name by which the fair god of ancient America was generally known was Quetzalcoatl. Quetzal was the name of the beautiful bird with the resplendent long green feathers and the dainty crest. Colt is the ancient Mexican word for serpent. Thus, the name Quetzalcoatl means literally Quetzal bird, serpent. Quetzalcoatl was the name applied to the New World god who was in the form of a man, bearded, white robed and a great teacher of moral principles, all right? A bearded man with a, with a rope and a great teacher of moral principles. The cult or serpent was an ancient symbol of Israel's Messiah, the anointed one. So the serpent meant the anointed one, all right? All right, so uh, just one quick reference, one more of uh, gets a call We're in this book, Antiquities of Mexico by Lord Kingsborough. I've explained this book some of my videos before uh research you know his nine volume collection what it's about and everything all these prestige libraries that are holding all these it's a facsimiles all right facsimiles of the mexican codices meaning exact copies all right they breaking down the plates and the codices all right it says here plate two quetzalcoatl it's a Kualtle, and it has this two marks here, right? You see that? Let's go to that footnote right now. It says, the Messiah. The Messiah is shadowed in the Old Testament under many types, such as those of a lion, a lamb, a roe, the morning star, or the planet Venus, otherwise called Lucifer, the sun, light, a rock, a stone, the branch, the vine, wine, bread, water, life, the way. And he is there recognizing the triple character of a king, a priest and a prophet we're talking about a khan king priest a prophet it is very extraordinary that quetzalcoatl who the mexicans believe equally to have been a king a prophet and a pontiff should also have been named by them seja cult or the morning star Tlaviscal pantecutli or light mesitli mesitli meshi messiah meshi all right so messiah says quetzalcoatl again is he who was born of the virgin he was born of a virgin whoa so wait a minute so wasn't also jesus born of a virgin did you know quetzalcoatl was born of a virgin you see these stories with the origin right all right so we're in this uh, book it's called a book of the beginnings by gerald massey all right and it says here as shu and anhar in egyptian mythology and moses and joshua conducted their people with the solar orb round the circle of science overcoming the opposing powers postulated by the early men so in the toltec mythology huemak or huematzin and quetzalcoatl quetzalcoatl conducted their people through the pilgrimage and wanderings recorded in their picture writing huemak like moses wrote the code of laws for the nation and conducted the civil government quetzalcoatl in relation to huemak plays the part of joshua again Quetzalcoatl in relation to who am I plays the part of Joshua. All right, so we weren't, we ain't talking about an allegorical New Testament Roman propaganda. Uh, Jesus, we're talking about the Torah. We're talking about foundational truth. We're talking about the person who really led the Israelites into Jerusalem, who took over after Moses, Meshi, who's called in the Old Testament Joshua, but his name is Jehawashi, right, or Jehoshua. Jahawashi, all right? When Quetzalcoatl began to keep the laws instead of Huemak, he sent a crier to the top of the mountain of outcry, whose voice could be heard for 300 miles round. Joshua follows Moses as the leader of Israel and instructs the people to go up against Jericho, his mountain of outcry, and assail it with a shout that ought to have been heard at an equal distance as it was loud enough to make the walls fall flat. The old red land, red land, Hue, Hue Tlapalan, was the name of the original home in the north from which the Toltecs migrated. All right, they're talking about Utah. What are you talking about? Their leader, Kitsukot, wore a long robe with crosses. He wore a long robe with crosses. Again, discovery of the origin of the name of America, right? 
it told us that when the person got bit by a snake, they put the sign of the cross on their tomb, which is the American Peruvian sign for the word Amaru, the cross, Amaru. It is Amaluk, cross Amaru, synonymous cross. All right. So again, Amaru is Quetzalcoatl and Quetzalcoatl, all right, again, he wears a long robe mark with crosses, crosses, Amaru, cross. The sign identifies him as the one who crosses, the one who crosses. Quetzalcoatl attained the land of promise and in his golden reign, an ear of wheat grew so large that one man could hardly carry it. Joshua led the people into the land flown with milk and honey, where a single bunch of grapes was a load for two men all right so we're talking about jahawashi quetzalcoatl amaru i know we went off the subject a little bit but you know it has to do with you know what we're talking about right they just added the ka so it's the land of amaraka amaru quetzalcoatl the plum serpent the khan the priest kings the land of the priest kings you understand Pastor john king david we're talking about uh ancient uh the, the seed we're talking about the true ibaria all right, just for a little bit more correlation, you know, since we're talking about this today and we got to this point, you know, we got this uh, documentary here, uh, research from the Brigham Young University in uh, Utah. Uh, the title of this is Quetzalcoatl, the Maya Maiz God and Jesus Christ, all right, by Diane E. Wirth, Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. Now, just what I want to mention real quick is, I don't know if you knew, but in, in the Mormon religion, Quetzalcoatl is actually... You know, they tell you Quetzalcoatl is actually Jesus, right? What they say is that it's Jesus when he resurrected and he came to America. That's their whole, you know, that's their little old own little hijack they added. All right. We're going to dodge the hijack big time. But at least, hey, man, they might be onto something. They just, you know, got to dodge the hijack with that Seuss stuff and that New Testament Christian kind of religious view of it, man. We're just talking about you are the book. We're just trying to show you a different correlation, a different story, a different way to see things that you thought was religion. You know, nobody's talking about religion right now. All right. So again, it says here, many scholars suggest that Quetzalcoatl of Mesoamerica, also known as the Feathered Serpent and the Maya Maiz God and Jesus Christ could all be the same being. By looking at the ancient Mayan writings, such as the Popo Vu, this theory is further explored and developed. These ancient writings include several stories that coincide with the stories of Jesus Christ in the Bible, such as the creation and the resurrection, the role that both Quetzalcoatl and the Maiz God played in bringing Maiz to humankind is comparable to Christ's role in bringing the bread of life to humankind. You understand how they hijacked the story? It's all about the corn, Maiz God, just like Mary is the corn mother. Nourishment. It became in Isis for nourishment, the mom. But it was always about the corn mother. Check out my corn videos. And I, I also mentioned this in my corn videos about Quetzalcoatl, how he's a, the Maiz deity. And uh, it's all represented about resurrection, just like Osiris. Just like Osiris is the god of um, resurrection and uh, nourishment too, like crops, agriculture and all that. He is a corn deity. Uh, literally, Osiris is a corn deity. He got corn growing out of him. It's, that's literal, man. Like you can go see, check out uh, my corn videos. All right, four parts. All right, so again, it says here the role that both Quetzalcoatl and Maiz God played in bringing Maiz to humankind is comparable to Christ's role in bringing the bread of life to humankind. Furthermore, Quetzalcoatl is said to have descended to the underworld to perform a sacrifice, strikingly similar to the atonement of Jesus Christ. These congruencies and others like them suggest that these three gods are in fact three, three representations of the same being all right so which one is the duplicate huh which one is the duplicate again this is the title of the book quetzalcoatl the maya maiz god and jesus christ it says here legends abound quetzalcoatl from mexico and central america bring forward tantalizing resemblances to aspects of the life and new world ministry of jesus christ all right so dodge the hijack remember <laughs> in the past some leaders of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints occasionally drew attention to certain of those similarities among these those mentioned in post-spanish conquest now we're going to get to what we read earlier about what's in the codices it says among those mentioned in post-spanish conquest manuscripts where that quetzalcoatl was the creator 
that he was born of a virgin all right he was born of a virgin that he was god of the air and earth air the rock the spirit and his manifestation as the feathered serpent the drakan the dragon the feathered serpent the priest king that he was white and bearded not white white was pure meaning pure white and bearded pure and bearded right bearded right beard beard people had beard right they say indians didn't have beard right that he came from heaven and was associated with the planet venus that he raised the dead and that he promised to return all right this is all in the mexican codices you see where they got these allegorical stories from right so we're going to come back to this in a future video just want to show you that the uh, in mormon religion uh you know literally quetzalcoatl is jesus christ in the mormon religion all right? i just wanted you guys to know that all right let's continue i'm gonna get into this book um, it's called Historia de las Indias de Nueva España, the Islas de Tierra Firme. This is written by Padre Fray Diego Duran, or the Fray, you know, the priest friar Diego Duran. All right. Um, obviously, I'm not going to read this in Spanish. I just wanted to show you that I have the original, uh, you know, written Spanish account. All right. All right. So in English, this book would be called The History of the Indies of New Spain. Again, by Fray Diego Duran, translated, annotated, and with an introduction by Torres Hayden, this version of it, right? All right, so before we continue, just want to talk about who Diego uh, Duran was. All right, so it says here in Wikipedia, Diego Duran was a Dominican friar, best known for his authorship of one of the earliest Western books on the history and culture of the Aztecs, one of the earliest ones, the history of the Indies of New Spain. A book that was much criticized in his lifetime for helping the heathen maintain their culture. Uh, helping the heathen. All right. Also known as the Duran Codex. All right. So it has another name called the Duran Codex. The history of the Indies of New Spain was completed about 1581. That's what we're about to read. Duran also wrote Book of the Gods and Rites in 1574. 1576 and ancient calendar in 1579 he was fluent in Ahualt, the aztec language and was therefore able to consult natives and aztec codices all right so he's interpreting from the actual codices and from personal conversations he had with these mexica people all right aztec as well as work done by earlier friars his empathetic nature allowed him to gain the confidence of many native people who would not share their stories with Europeans and was able to document many previously unknown folktales and legends that make his work unique. All right. All right. So I'm going to start writing chapter one. Right. We're going to start in this book. And I just wanted to show this in Spanish. So anybody out there who knows Spanish, you can just in translate it yourself. You can pause it. We're going to go back to the English version. I've pretty much verified it's pretty accurate, the translation, all right? So let's go to it right now. Again, we're in the book, The History of the Indies of New Spain, written by the Fray Diego Duran, very primary source. And it says here, in order to provide a truthful and reliable account of the origin of these Indian nations, an origin so doubtful and obscure, we would need some divine revelation or assistance to reveal this origin to us and help us understand it. They're trying to figure you out so much. All right. However, lacking that revelation, we can only speculate and conjecture about these beginnings, basing ourselves on the evidence. All right. So let's just base ourselves on the evidence. All right. Not theories provided by these people whose strange ways conduct and lowly actions are so like those of the Hebrews. Like what? Like who? Like the Hebrews. Fray Diego Duran telling you straight up chapter one, right in the beginning. Thus we can almost positively affirm that they are Jews and Hebrews. What does this mean, Jews and Hebrews? I thought it was the same thing. Dodge the hijack with Jews. No J's, all right, in Paleo Hebrew. Hebrew, Eber, feather, pinion. He who lives on the opposite side, cr the crossing, Eber. He who separated himself in the Tower of Babel, and his language did not get confused, Eber. 
Hebrew, an ancestor of Abraham. Abra means pinion. Abra, feather. Feathers up. And I would not commit a great error if I were to state this as fact. He ain't committing an error telling you these are Hebrews because he knows it's a fact considering their way of life, their ceremonies, their rites and superstitions, their omens and hypocrisies. So a king too and characteristic of those of the Hebrews. In no way do they seem to defer. The Holy Scriptures bear witness to this. If you read your scriptures, you will see this and you see their ceremonies. And if you read their codices, you will see same stories as the Old Testament. And from them, we draw proofs and reason for holding this opinion to be true. As proof thereof, we know that this newly arrived nation, latecomers from strange and remote regions, made a long and tedious journey, searching and finally taking possession of this land. They spent many months and years in coming to this place. The truth of this matter can be found by drawing on their traditions and paintings and by talking to their elders, some of whom are very old. All right, not because he's making stuff up in his mind and he wants to be famous and has an agenda or he's a Sephardic Jew. You know, no, they don't, you, you know, it's deeper than that. Dot your own hijack. All right, he's talking to the elders. They're straight up telling him. But right now we're in the library of the Aboriginal American literature. All right, number six, edited by D.G. Brinton, M.D. And we are in the annals of the Kachikels, the original text with a translation notes and introduction by Daniel G. Brinton, MD, professor of ethnology and archaeology at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. He was president of the Numismatic and Antiquarian Society of Philadelphia, member of the American Philosophical Society, the American Antiquarian Society, the Historical Societies of Pennsylvania and New York, etc. Member de la Société Royale des Antiquaries du Nord, de la Société Americaine de France, all right, French, de la Société de Anthropologie de Paris. Delegué General de Institución de Ethnography, Vice President du Congress Internacional, Vice President of the International Congress of the Americanist, Correspondent Member of the Anthropological Society of Washington. All right, is this pseudo? All right, can we, can we say we can trust this as a source, at least as a scholarly source, all right? We always got to dodge the hijack, take the babies out, but, all right, let's go into this book. Now, I'm going to read from the preface. You know, I hate to just go through the whole details, but I we just want everybody to have a clear perspective when we're reading these texts and, 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 you know, where are they coming from, all right? So it says here, both for its historical and linguistic merits, the document which is presented in this volume is one of the most important in Aboriginal American literature, most important written by the native who had grown to adult years before the whites penetrated to his ancestral home all right this is a translation of the kachikels all right these were quiche maya people all right so it's saying that this is a personal written account of one of these quiche people the kachikels who had grown to adult years before the whites penetrated to his ancestral home himself a member of the ruling family of one of the most civilized nations of the continent and intimately acquainted with its traditions. His work displays the language in its pure original form. All right, so this book contains the original Kachikel uh, language, the way he wrote it, right, in his language. And then it's translated from there, from the original, and also preserves the tribal history and a part of the mythology as they were current before they were in the least affected by European influences. Before any so-called agenda by a Sephardic Jew or any Jew trying to establish or any goat worshiping people, man, you are lost. All right. These are personal 
historical account from the Kachikel himself before any European influence. That's what we're about to read. And we're going to show you what they were writing in their annals, in their documents, in their history. Again, we're just in the annals of the Kachikels. All right. It says here, introduction, if not like position, if not logic, I'm sorry, position of the Kachikels. The Kachikels whose tradition and early history are given in the present work from the pen of one of their own authors were a nation of somewhat advanced culture who occupied a portion of the area of the present state of Guatemala. All right. They were one of the group of four closely related nations, adjacent in territory and speaking dialects, so nearly alike as to be mutually intelligible. The remaining three were the Quiches, all right, Quiches, that's their family, I told you, the Tsutsuhils and the Akahals, who dwelt respectively to the west, the south, and the east of the Kachikels. All right, so that was just an introduction of what we're about to read. I just wanted you to have a clear perspective. All right, so let's belly flop to the part that correlates with what we were just reading in the Histories of the New Spain by Diego Du. All right, so this is like what the original um, pronunciation of, of their writing would sound like. So it's like, so, it, you know, that's what he's translating. I just want to show you that, all right? All right, so we're going to go right here belly flop to page 79 remember this is a their story this is their story of how they arrived in guatemala all right in their journey so on page 79 it says then we arrived at the sea coast we arrived at the sea coast they were gathered together the warriors of all the seven villages at the sea a great number perished devoured by sorrow there is no means of passing nor it is told of anyone who has passed the sea they can't cross the sea. Oh no, said all the warriors of the seven villages. Who can, who will find means to pass the sea? In thee alone, my brother, in thee alone have we hope, said they all. Who they referring to? We said to them, you may go on, you may be first. Who will find the means of crossing while we are here? All of us spoke thus and then all of them said, have pity on us. Our brother, since we are all stretched on the shore of the ocean without seeing our hills and plains. As soon as we were asleep, we were conquered. We, the two oldest sons, we, the chiefs and guides of the warriors of the seven villages, of all oh, my brother, two oldest sons. Would that we had passed and could see the burdens given us by our mothers and fathers, oh my brother, so they spoke. At that time, the Quiche nation had increased. Our ancestors, Gagavits and Saktekao said, we said to them, we suffer also our brother. We do not live stretched out on the shore of the ocean where we cannot see our mountains, where they are, as you say, oh, you warriors, you people of the seven villages, we shall pass over at once. Thus we spoke and soon all of them rejoiced now there was a red tree again now there was a red tree this is the part all right it close attention a red tree are we talking about a cedar tree our staff whoa there was a red tree which is our staff did moses carry a staff which we had taken in passing from the gate of tulan in the gate of tulan aslan utah and therefore we are called the Kachikel people, the people of the red tree or staff, the red tree where the cedars are. We're talking about Lebanon, Aslan, place of whiteness. Oh, our sons said Gagavits and Saktekau. The root of this, our staff, was pushed into the sand of the sea. Okay, what did they do? The root of this, our staff, was pushed into the sand of the sea. The staff was put onto the sand of the sea. And soon the sea was separated from the sand. The sea was separated from the sand. And for this, the red tree served, which we brought from Tulan. That's the, what the red tree, the staff served for. So it can part the sea, separate. Sea was separated from the sand. 
when the root of this staff was pushed into the sand of the sea and the sea was separated from the sand. They parted the sea. The Kachikels parted the sea, their leader, with a staff. This is their writing. We're in Exodus, we're in chapter 14, we're going to start in verse 9. It says, The Egyptian army, with all the horses, chariots, and the drivers, pursued them and caught up with them, where they were camped by the Red Sea. They were camped by the Red Sea. Camped by the Red Sea. So they were living on the shore, just like the Kachikels just told us. When they arrived at the shore, they couldn't see their planes. They wanted to cross near Fi, Hahiroth, and Bal, Sephon. When the Israelites saw the king and his army marching against them, they were terrified and cried out to the Lord for help. Didn't we just read the Kachikel telling us? The annals of the Kachikels, again, who can, who will find means to pass the sea? And thee alone, my brother, and thee alone have we hope, said they all. We hope, said they all. Again, they were terrified and cried out to Hawa for help. They said to Moses, they said to who? Oh, brother. They said to their brother Moses, were there any graves in Egypt? Did you have to bring us out here in the desert to die? Look what you have done by bringing us out of Egypt. Didn't we tell you before we left that this would happen? We told you to leave us alone and let us go on being slaves of the Egyptians. It would be better to be slaves there to, than to die here in the desert. Do you want to be a slave? Is it better to be a slave? Moses answered, don't be afraid. Stand your ground and you will see what Hawa will do to save you today. You will never see these Egyptians again. Hawa will fight for you. And all you have to do is keep still, just chill, just breathe easy. <gasps> wow. And Hawa said to Moses, why are you crying out for help? Tell the people to move forward. Keep it moving. Lift up your walking stick. Your stick. We're talking about a staff. Lift up your red stick. All right. That you got from Toulon. Your red stick. Kachikel. And hold it out over the sea. The water will divide. And the Israelites will be able to walk through the sea on dry ground. I will make the Egyptians so stubborn that they will go in after them. And I will gain honor by my victory over the king, his army, his chariots, and his drivers. When I defeat them, the Egyptians will know that I am Hawa. All right. So this stick helped Moses divide the water, separate the water. Anos of the Kachikels. And we had a red tree which was our staff. We had a red tree, my people, our staff. All right, the root of this, our staff, was pushed into the sand of the sea, and soon the sea was separated from the sand. And for this, the red tree surf, surf which we brought from Toulon. Soon the sand was as line, and we passed out. It became wide above the sea and below the sea. Then all rejoiced, we rejoiced, when they saw sand in the sea. When they saw the sand split, when they saw they can walk through it, they gave thanks, they rejoiced. And many consulted together. There indeed is our hope. We must gather together on these first lands, they said. Here only can we arrange ourselves since leaving Toulon. And they're talking about arriving at Mexico. So where was this Red Sea? Because we're talking about a parting of the seas, and we're talking about these cachiquels who went to Mexico, right? And we're talking about the Bible tells us it's on the Red Sea, and uh, you know, respect to UB News for bringing this this perspective. And as you see here on this map, which is the codfish map of North America from Herman Mole, 1720, all right, you can see that it says in between the uh, Baja California and Mexico is the Gulf of California. And we see it says Gulf of California or Red Sea. 
All right, Red Sea, the Red Sea, the Gulf of California, or the Red Sea. All right, let's back up so you can see where we are. All right, U.S., Louisiana, or Florida, New France up here, the whole, look at this, the whole East Coast. All right, but you see the Gulf of California or the Red Sea shows California as an island. All right, we know where was Utah, Utah around over here. We're talking about Aslan and migration. You know, uh, we know that the, we know that the uh, also the Colorado River, right? The Colorado River empties into the Gulf of California. You can see on, on old maps as well. All right, Rio Colorado just means red. So did the sea really extend all the way up here before? Right? Uh, we know that the Salt Lake is a salt. You know that was an ancient ocean up there, right? All right, so Colorado. Gulf of California or Red Sea. All right, it's all kind of the same. All right, so I found this article. It's called Names for the Gulf of California, a historical review by C. R. C. Brusca, with great assistance from Ezekiel Escura and Jorge Soberon, compiled in 2005, updated in 2018. Summary, the Gulf of California has been called many things, but collectively, with spelling variations aside, these boil down to four names. See chronology below. So it says here, number one, Mar Bermejo, or Vermilion Sea, Vermilion Sea. You're going to see that in a lot of maps on the Gulf of California. The original name given by Francisco Ulloa in 1539. So even though we just saw that uh, map from 1700s, this was a reference they were given to the Gulf of California since at least 1539. The first person in historic times to sell to the head of the Gulf. The name also appears as Vermiglion. Vermijo and Rojo. So Vermejo, right? Or Vermejo, Vermejo, right? Etymology from Old Portuguese, Vermejo, red. Red. Again, Vermejo means red sea. So the Vermejo sea is, means red sea. Again, as an adjective, Vermejo, right? It says red, having red at its color, red, socialist or communist. So Vermejo, noun. As a noun, red, color, color, as an adjective, red. All right, as a noun and as an adjective, it means red, red. All right, so we're in this map, is the map of North and South America, uh, and it shows the Northwestern uh, part of America blank. Some say because it was all occupied, many maps have this area blank, and a lot of people on YouTube saying because this is the land of giants. So, you know, it was, you know, you couldn't get through there and they couldn't map it, whatever, but you know, it shows that a lot and it shows California as an island as well. And it says here again, Mare Vermeo, Vermeo, Mare Vermeo, Red Sea. All right, we know what that means now, Red Sea. So when you see this on maps, you know that means red. And then we got Mare Rubrum, Rubrum, Rufrum, Rufrum. All right, we're going to get into that. All right, so Mare Rubrum, remember Mare Rubrum? So it says here on the Red Sea in Wikipedia, on the Red Sea, all right, let's go to um, names. It says Red Sea is a direct translation of the Greek Erita Thalassa. In Latin, what is it called? Mare Rubrum, Mare Rubrum, all right? Red Sea is Mare Rubrum in Latin. You're going to see that in a lot of the maps. Again, we got... Mare Vermeo and Mare Rubrum, two different languages, just to make it clear for you, Red Sea. Again, we're returning to the anus of the Kachi Kells, now that we got a clear perspective, right, what they're crossing. They rushed forth and passed across the sand. This is a account of one of them. This is their personal history. This is not European influence. This is a direct translation of the Kachi Kel language. All right, it says, they rushed forth and passed across the sand. And following one another, we came to the shore of the sea. And we arrived at the edge of the water. Again, don't forget, we were in the history of the Indies of New Spain by the Fray Diego Duran, a primary source during the time of conquest. All right, and he was telling us right before we left that what clearer proof do we need that these people, he's talking about the Mexica, were Jews or Hebrews. Then their own reference to the flight from Egypt, wherein Moses moved the waters with his rod. The sea opened up 
a path appeared, and after Pharaoh followed with his army, God caused the sea to return to its place, with the result that all their enemies drowned in the deep. And if this account is not convincing enough, I should like to tell about another event that the Aztecs claim happened on their long migration. All right, so he's telling you straight up that the elder, Mexica elder, told him this, telling their history, explaining it word by word, the same story in Exodus. All right. Now, I just want to read uh, this footnote uh, regarding what um, Diego Duran said about, you know, the story about them parting the sea, separating the sea. Right, it says Duran's leaning toward biblical interpretations is seen in his claims that Quetzalcoatl, all right, opened a path in the sea with his rod, the waters returning to their place and drowning the pursuers after the followers of the divine personage had fled to safety. Quetzalcoatl, whose name means feather serpent, was also called Se Akalt. One read his birth date in Topiltzin, our Lord. All right, so say a cult topil sin, right? Or Quetzalcoatl, our prince, one reed feathered serpent. Look at the time. It's a mythologized figure appearing in 16th century accounts of Nahua historical traditions, where he is identified as the ruler in the 10th century of the Toltecs. This was a real person, all right? Of the Toltecs by Aztec tradition, their predecessors who had political control of the Valley of Mexico and surrounding regions several centuries before the Aztecs themselves arrived on the scene. In later generations, he was a figure of legend, often confused or conflated with the important Mesoamerican deity, Quetzalcoatl. Right, according to the legend in Salvador, the city of Cuscatlan, the capital city of the Pipil Cuscatlex, was founded by the exiled Toltec. Say a cult topil sin. All right. So this is what he looks like in the codices. I have, you know, the, the exact codices, and you can see he, they depicted him with copper color, right? All right. He's holding up the snake, right? Moses also held up a brass snake, right? Once he left Tolan, the name was used by other elite figures again once he left Tolan the same name what name Quetzalcoatl was used by other elite figures are they talking about his descendants huh to keep a lion succession and was also used by the Mexica Mexica Meshek to more easily rule over the Toltecs all right so we're in the book Antiquities of Mexico it says here comprising facsimiles of ancient Mexican paintings and hieroglyphics. And these are, you know, source the sources of these, you know, the, the book he compiled here, the person, are from the Royal Libraries of Paris, Berlin, and Dresden, the Imperial Library of Vienna, in the Vatican Library, in the Borgian Museum at Rome, in the Library of the Institute at Bologna, and in the Bloodian Library at Oxford. All right, and this is compiled by Lord Kingsborough. This is volume six, all right, volume six, all right. And it says here, this is part of a, a footnote. It is certainly remarkable as connected with the expectation which the Mexicans entertained of a future redeemer. The Quetzalcoatl should have been called by them by the other name of Mesitli or Mesitli. Cortes, in describing to the Emperor Charles V the horrors which the Mexicans sustained during the last days of the siege in Gomara, and repeating the same history, both mentioned that they consoled themselves in their last sufferings with the hopes of going to heaven to Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl was worshipped by the Mexicans under the name of Huitzilopochtli. Right, very important, remember that name. All right, so Quetzalcoatl was worshipped by the Mexicans as Huitzilopochtli. Lo Puchtli, so they're the same, which name was corrupted by the Spaniards into O Chilobus, so that the accounts of Cortes and Gomorrah perfectly agree. In Cholula, this god was known by the peculiar appellation of Quetzalcoatl. All right, so Cholula, right? Before the Aztecs, that was a Toltec city, the Toltecs, all right, which signifies the green feathered serpent, feathered serpent, Drakan. All right, Dragon Kings, Feathered Serpent, Snake Dynasty, the Brass Serpent, Moshe, Meshi. 
With respect to the appellation Mexitli, the Spanish thus marked being always pronounced like a C. It is very remarkable that it is precisely the same as the Hebrew name, and it has these words, and I believe it's Meshach or Messiah, for Tli does not form a part of that proper name, but it is a common termination to Mexican names. This name from which I think it's Christos right here, Christos, in Greek is derived, signifies anointed, and is peculiarly applied by Christians to Christ. The following passage, translated from the second section of the seventh chapter of the third book of Garcia's Origin of the Indians, shows that the attention of that learned writer had been drawn to this coincidence. In New Spain, the word Mexico or Mexico is found, which, as Brother Stephen de Salazar remarks in Hebrew, and is therefore produced in the second psalm and signifies his anointed. And although there is that province, it is the name of a city. And here in the psalm, the name which the Jews bestowed on their kings and priests, their kings, priests or priests, kings, khans, drakhans, feather serpent, and our Christ our Lord, who as they expected was to come and redeem them still. I do not attend to this difference, as this name might easily have been given to a city, since the leader who conducted those people, Mexico, was named Meshi, Messi, Meshi, Moshe, Moshi, or as others write, Meshi, and the city and nation were afterwards called after him, in the same way as we see that many cities, provinces, and nations have been named after those who peopled or founded them, or to whom they owed their origin. As we shall pre presently point out, the word Meshi should be noted as being really Hebrew. It's Hebrew, and it agrees surprisingly with the name of the chief head or captain of the Mexicans or Mexicans, all right, after Meshi. Now, this is uh, a part of the book where they're um, talking about the explanation of the Codex Vaticanus, all right, one of the Aztec codices, all right.